Today's scripture reading, second scripture reading, is from Ezekiel chapter 47. Um, This can be found on page 1332 on your pew Bible, in your pew Bible. Ezekiel chapter 47 from verse 1. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out to the north gate and led me around to the outside, to the outer gate, facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, He measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in. A river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from Engedi to El Gaim. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. It's the word of the Lord written for his people. Thanks, Femi. Morning. For those of you who uh, don't worship with us regularly, my name is Devin. I'm one of the pastors here at High Point Church. Uh, first, let me just join Aaron in saying happy birthday to Jason. You know something about a guy when you've never really hung out with him, but he'll just show up with you in the middle of a workday to help you move furniture? That's Jason. So all of you who have furniture to move, he's the guy to talk to. <laughs> I also want to say happy Easter. If, if you hadn't thought about it yet, no, I, I, I'm... I'm not looking at the wrong day on the calendar. This is actually still Easter. Until the 5th of June, you get to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. You get to remember that he died, was entombed, rose again on the third day, and that because he rose again on the third day, you can have hope and life every day. So don't forget about it. Um, Consider this your church calendar public service announcement. Also, uh, I have a new favorite website that I think you should all be aware of. It is https colon backslash backslash highpointchurch.org slash sermon slides. Are you aware of this website? <laughs> yeah, check it out. It's great. Riveting content drops daily or every week at least. Here endeth the announcements. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you that uh, you speak to us in ways that are profound and beyond our understanding, that you're a God who hides himself, and yet you're a God who speaks and who desires to be known. So thank you, God, that when you speak in your way, in your mysterious way, you also come and open the eyes of our hearts and our minds to comprehend. So Lord, today, uh, come and by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us hear what you are saying to your church. Let us grow up in grace and in godliness, proclaim your word faithfully, live uh, lives of righteousness that are pleasing to you, 
and that stand out so that we shine like stars in the midst of our present generation. I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, my history with the text that Femi just read really began last November or December. There's a women's Bible study that meets as a part of this church. And the leaders of that Bible study were coming up to this section of Ezekiel. They were a few chapters ahead of us in our sermon series, but they were all going through Ezekiel together, kind of page by page by page. And they were looking ahead and seeing all this stuff about this temple. So one of the leaders came to me and said, okay, Devin, what is up with Ezekiel's temple? And I said, let me tell you. And then I looked at it, and then I went to the Bible study, and I said, I can tell you four things that this might be that I don't agree with. And that's about as far as I could go. Um, And this is actually one of the things that I love about the Bible and love about the way that God speaks to us. When he speaks to us, he's not speaking to us the way that a marketing team writes a commercial, where their job is to hook you fast, get you emotionally invested, and then hit you with the one tiny little point that you should take away. When God speaks to his people, uh, he comes to us with something profound and mysterious that grabs you and arrests your attention, but you come away from it going, huh, huh? What was all that about? I mean, one of, my, one of my favorite stories from the early church is a story of four monks from the desert who were on their way to visit the guy who was kind of undisputedly the spiritual hero of their day. Um, so anyway, maybe you don't think about monks that way. So just think about the one pastor, preacher, who, whoever it is that you think of as your personal hero of the faith. Like if you could spend an afternoon with any hero of the Christian faith, who would it be? Put that figure in your mind. For these four monks, it was a guy named St. Anthony. And so they're wandering through the desert, kind of fangirling out, just getting so geeked up about seeing Anthony. And then they get to Anthony. And the first thing he does is he asks him about a passage of scripture. He says, what does that mean? And the youngest monk says, well, I think it means this. And the next oldest monk says, well, I think it means that. And then the third oldest monk says, well, I think it actually probably means this. But all the while, there's this, there's this guy named Abba Joseph, the fourth monk, the oldest of the four. He's just kind of sitting there. And Antony's like, Joseph, what do you think it means? He goes, I don't know. And Antony says, Abba Joseph has found the answer. That's one of the reasons I loved Nick's sermon last week is because he could tell you all of the things that Ezekiel's temple might be, but he wasn't going to be presumptuous and stake his claim on any one. So uh, now that I've taught to you about the virtues of humility and interpretation, I'm going to tell you what Ezekiel's temple means. (laughs) Um, My first answer is, I don't know. But my second answer is that I think faithfully, when you study the history of this interpretation in the church, you can give a very good answer for what Ezekiel's temple is and what all this stuff around Ezekiel's temple is. Uh, One of my favorite early church fathers talks about the way that when you encounter a mysterious biblical, biblical text, it's kind of like grabbing a door handle and finding it locked. But then you look around and you see that there's a pile of keys there and you just have to fumble around and find the right key until you twist it in the door and it pops open. This is the way that the early church read this text. And what you find from the third, fourth, fifth century on is that when Christians read about Ezekiel's temple, they kept going back to the same bits of the New Testament again and again and again to explain it. And that bit of the New Testament was the Gospel of John, and especially John chapter 21, which Femi read at the beginning of the service. And Even more interestingly, because a lot of times we think about the early church and modern biblical scholarship as being at odds with each other, open a bunch of modern commentaries on Ezekiel or John, and you'll find that people keep pointing out these same intertextual connections between one and the other. So you've got, like in Ezekiel 34, all this stuff about good shepherds and Jesus calling himself the good shepherd. You've got uh, Jesus calling his body a temple. And then you've got this new and mysterious temple in Ezekiel. You've got this theme of living water. You've even got this little detail about this massive catch of fish where you're not supposed to be catching a bunch of fish. And John even goes out of his way in chapter 21 to tell you the number of the fish, 153, right? Now, that's kind of a weird detail to throw in, but every commentator that I've ever read on John is like, nope, that number has got to be significant because John does not play around with numbers. Like, he orders the whole life of Jesus around, like, factors of seven. There's something going on here with this number. 
And uh, one scholar pointed out that if you add up the numerical value of uh, the letters of one of the places in Ezekiel 47 and Reglime where they're throwing fishing nets, it equals 153. Uh, so there's probably some kind of really strong connection going on between the Gospel of John and this bit of Ezekiel. And you find this just come up again and again and again and again in the history of the ways that Christians have read the book of Ezekiel. So, if that's the case, then Ezekiel is definitely speaking to ancient Israel. And if that's the case, then Ezekiel is also definitely speaking to us today about Jesus and who he is and about the nature of the church that we find ourselves a part. And if there's one reason that I, as a Christian pastor, love the book of Ezekiel, it's because he is one of the great prophets of the new covenant to which we all belong. In Ezekiel 36, he prophesies that there's going to be a time when God puts a new heart and a new spirit in people so that they faithfully keep his word and obey his commandments in a way that nobody up to that point in time has been able to do. And I think that what we find in Ezekiel 47 is basically a symbolic outline of every major component of the new covenant. Temple, river, dead sea, fish and fishermen, salt and trees. Now, uh, there would be some virtue to doing like a whole sermon series on every one of those elements and just going super deep on Jesus is the temple and going super deep on this river of living water, and so on. But there's also some virtue in kind of holding them all together and doing the 30,000-foot version and seeing how they all fit together coherently. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, but first, I just want to say, maybe, am I going backwards? Yeah. This is why I don't do sermon slides. This is where we're going. I'm just going to touch on all of these points. How does an Old Testament prophecy like this work? Uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a buddy named Chris. I mean, we were never like really, really close friends, but we, we had a lot in common. We had both grown up in sort of white, low church, evangelical settings, and now we found ourselves at this kind of big, mostly theologically progressive seminary. Uh, but one of the big differences between Chris and me is that he was also a, a DJ. He played a lot of big clubs in Atlanta. He had a show on a local hip-hop station. So he was always playing music that I had never heard of. And one of the genres that he introduced me to is a genre called mashups. Has anyone ever heard of mashups? Yeah. So... You find some DJs like this guy, Danger Mouse, who takes the Beatles' white album and Jay-Z's black album and takes elements from them, plays them both at the same time, and calls it the gray album. Or you've got guys like Scott Melker who take, <laughs> who take like classic Hall & Oates songs from the 80s. You know, like, you're a rich girl and you're gone too far. And then he plays like... Kanye or T.I. over the top of them, and it works somehow. It's just mind-blowing to me, but you have these two songs that come together to make one song that's enjoyable as itself, but if you could separate them back out, you could find inside this one song true messages for two different audiences at two different places in time. So like white girls named Kimberly in the 80s with blown out hair and leg warmers, would really be vibing with Hall and Oates, but on the other hand, when I hear some of the hip hop that this guy named Melker puts over the top of Hall and Oates, it just takes me back to my time in Atlanta when there would be like some E Series Mercedes buzzing past me at 200 miles an hour with a sound system strong enough to pretty much knock my little Honda Civic off the edge of the freeway. All of this is happening at once, and that's what Ezekiel sounds like to me. It's one song, but inside there you can find these little pieces and nuances that are really addressing Israel in the past, but that are also really speaking to us today. And I know you're all sitting here thinking, did he seriously just mention, like, T.I. and hip-hop in a sermon? I thought pastors only listened to Stephen Curtis Chapman. <laughs> but... Take it, don't take that as an endorsement, not necessarily uh, for th this only reason, but like, there's real copyright infringement problems with this kind of music, but eh, let's not think too hard about that. Um, but this is the way that Old Testament prophecy typically works. I mean, even take a super famous Old Testament prophecy. Like, if you could only pick one Old Testament prophecy to, to poll the audience on, I'm guessing you'd get the highest return rate on this one, where in Isaiah 7, God says to Isaiah, Behold, 
the virgin will conceive, right? Now, when you get to the gospel of Matthew, Matthew says that Jesus' birth to the Virgin Mary happened in order to fulfill what God says to Isaiah in Isaiah 7. But what happens if you read the rest of Isaiah? You turn the page to Isaiah chapter 8, and the next thing that happens is Isaiah and his wife have a son. So God is definitely talking to Isaiah and giving a sign to ancient Israel in his time, and he's using that same prophecy at a different level of meaning to tell the church today that Jesus' virgin birth fulfilled that prophecy, even though there was also an ancient baby who was born who also fulfilled the prophecy. It happens in Ezekiel too. What's going on with the Valley of Dry Bones? Well, God is telling ancient Israel that he is able to take them in exile where they're scattered like dead bones in a field and bring them back together and make them live in their land again. But he's also simultaneously telling the church that he is the God who is able to raise the dead and that he is accomplishing that through his servant Jesus who's alive today with us. That Jesus is not just like some ancient historical figure who we have to study real carefully to try and figure out what he was like then. That Jesus is our contemporary today, alive and yet more alive than any of us are. So when you come across a, a tough passage like this, these are the kind of levels of meaning that you should expect to find and that you should humbly seek for prayerfully. Okay. So what's going on with this temple and this river? I've already kind of hinted at it. I mean, this temple is recognizably to Ezekiel, who is, by the way, if you remember to the early chapters of the book, a priest. Ezekiel knows exactly what he's looking at, but he should also know, based on the measurements, that this is not like any other temple that's ever been built. And by the way, if you go to the history after Ezekiel, it's not like any temple that has been built after him. But the basic logic of Israelite temples still holds true. What you should think about when you see an Israelite temple is that this is basically a place that's sort of a singularity. This is the point in physical space where the creator of the universe and creation collapse into one thing where you have God enthroned above the cherubim and you know that God has made it his will to rule and reign and live with people in the material created world forever. God dwells there. But you also know that a temple is a place of atonement for sin. That for whatever reason, human beings fell, the whole of creation was subject to futility, that sin is now wreaking havoc in the world, and that when individual Israelites would sin, the only way forward for them was to bring a sacrifice to the temple because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And then the sin that was on them would accrue to the holy place and then they could go away forgiven. So all of that logic, you should assume, still holds true for Ezekiel's temple. But there's good reasons to say that this temple and also the river that come from it are promising something more than just the restoration of temple worship in ancient Israel. And here I would point you to John chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. Jesus is having a disputation with some folks. They don't quite understand who he is and what he's doing. So Jesus answers them in a way that I actually don't think helped them all that much. Surprise, surprise. He says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. People reply, okay, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was the temple of his body. And in the same way, a couple chapters later, Jesus is in Jerusalem, in front of the temple at a big festival, and Jesus stands up and says in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Now, if you know the rest of your Bible and you can think about texts like 1 Corinthians, you know that every Christian is also at some level a little walking temple. We are also a place where God dwells and where the Spirit of God dwells and we are made to house him and carry him with us everywhere that we go. But what's going on in John chapter 7 isn't that Jesus is just saying that uh, in the future, all of you will be my little temples walking around with the Spirit uh, gushing out of you. He's saying, you can come to me right now and drink. There is already 
living water flowing from Jesus. Jesus, you know from his baptism, has received the Spirit of God, and he's walking around and exemplifying what it means to be a true human being filled with the Spirit of God with a river of living water flowing out. He's already making alive. This is what you should see in Jesus' words and miracles in the Gospel of John, is the Spirit, the river of living water flowing out from him, and exemplifying what it means to be a faithful person. And to me, that kind of reduces me to silence. When I think about who Jesus is, I have to think of him in the same way that I think about like Solomon's temple, as this point of singularity where the created world and the creator of the world collapse into one thing, And yet the creator remains the creator and the created world remains the created world. But this is who he is and this is the mystery of the incarnation that he is one person with two natures. And it's only because of who he is that the spirit, the life-giving spirit can gush out from him and start giving life to the whole world. And that's really good news because if there was if there was ever one great symbol of the world today, I think it's probably the Dead Sea. How many of you in here like to fish? Yeah. For those of you who do like to fish, just think to yourself, I mean, what would happen if you dropped a fish? Say, you know, your favorite fish, largemouth bass, northern pike, walleye, musky, whatever. What would happen if you dropped a musky into the Dead Sea? Yeah, I mean, you're going to see it flopping around desperately, and then before too long, it goes belly up. Why is that? It's because there's no oxygen that's in the water. It's because the salinity is so intense that it will literally choke the life out of anything in there. The Dead Sea didn't get its name by accident. I mean, I'm told that there are like some single-cell organisms that can actually kind of survive in the Dead Sea, but nothing bigger than that. It's just, it is a total liquid wasteland. I think this is a perfect picture of the nature of the world that we find ourselves in today. The world is a dead sea. Like Paul says in Romans 8, creation has been given over to futility. And I don't know, when when I think about the dead sea and the world that we find ourselves in, I always find my mind drawn back to the story of Cain and Abel. I don't think there's a clearer picture of the way that you can see that the whole of the world right now is ordered towards death than the story of Cain and Abel. I mean, put yourself in Adam and Eve's shoes. You've sinned in the garden. For the first time, you've seen an animal slain. You're wearing those skins on your back. You're going out. You're having children, and you're enduring for the first time. You're seeing it. You're experiencing it. The awful pangs of childbirth. Nothing in your existence can prepare you for it, even if you're told. And Adam is going out to the field day by day to, like, to try and toil against the earth to produce enough food for him and his family. And he's got two sons. And then one day, Adam and Eve are sitting there, and they're waiting for their son Abel. They're waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting. And he doesn't come back. He doesn't come back. And they're not sure why. They don't really know what's happened. But eventually, they come upon his corpse out in the field, and they look down, and they see a dead human body for the first time, and they realize they've only ever seen an image of death like this before, and the image of the animal that was killed to make their skins. They had no idea what they were doing when they gave in to temptation and ceded the authority that was given them by God over to the enemy so that the whole world became ordered towards the production of death instead of life and fruitfulness. But then they look down on their son's dead face, and they see, and they know, and that awful moral clarity washes over them. This is what we did. This is the world that you and I live in and that we keep on building today and perpetuating. Look at the trauma around us. Now, depending on where you are politically and even theologically, it's really, really tempting either to focus on the systemic problems in the world today or the individual problems in the world today. So take an awful example of sin, like the racially motivated murder of peaceful shoppers in a grocery store in the last week. On the one hand, 
That is the work of a deranged and sinful individual man who made horrible choices, who let himself be so consumed by hate that he disregarded the image of God and his fellow human beings. On the other hand, that single moral actor is also part of and perpetuates a system that from the dawn of modernity has degraded and devalued black people. The individual's action perpetuates the system and the system conditions the individual actor. They work together symbiotically towards this one end, the production of death. Take another example, pornography use. The statistics on pornography use in and out of the church are horrifying. But pornography use is not just an individual choice. Pornography use is participating in a $100 billion global industry that takes human beings and turns their bodies into commodities for consumption. The one perpetuates the other, reinforces, and perpetuates the power of death. So, here's the Dead Sea. It's where we find ourselves now. How does God respond? He establishes his temple, Jesus, and he makes the living water of the Holy Spirit flow from it. And when the living water flows from the temple into the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea starts to come to life. It starts to come back to life. Everything, the whole principle of death that has governed creation, starts to work backwards. Suddenly, we start to see the truth of a chapter like Isaiah 25, where Isaiah prophesies that there's going to be a time when on the holy mountain, God is going to destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers up all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from the earth. So if the world that we live in is the Dead Sea, This means, one, that it's still appointed to all of us to die once and to stand before the judgment of God. But it also means that you no longer have to live as a slave to the fear of death while you look forward to the fulfillment of Isaiah 25. Um, Since I've already talked about monks once in this sermon, I'm going to do it again. But if there's a running joke on staff, it's that if Pastor Nick is an aspirational redneck who just wants to have five Chevys up on blocks, I'm an aspirational monk who would just be very happy in his cell praying until the Lord returns or he, or he calls me home. But there's a great story that comes from one of, the, uh, one of the most important monasteries in the world today. It's, a, it's an island in Greece called Mount Athos, and really there's just tons of monasteries on this little island. But uh, if you were a monk on Mount Athos and you were just becoming a monk, this is the advice that you would get from your spiritual master pretty much every day. Make death your friend. Make death your friend. Um, not, not because monks are especially morbid, but because monks know the truth of what David prayed. Teach me to number my days. When you number your days and you live in awareness of impending death as a Christian... You don't have to sit there in fearful expectation of some void beyond. You don't have to live desperately trying to scratch out some meaning for your life in this world. You don't have to think of yourself as Sisyphus, doomed to push a rock up to the top of a mountain for all eternity just to have it roll back to the bottom and hope that there's enough in that struggle to fill your heart. If you are a Christian and you are numbering your days and you remember the certainty of your death, but also the certain hope of your resurrection, then you have the opportunity every day to store up treasures in heaven. You have the opportunity to look for a country that's never going to perish, spoil, or fade in the incorruptible inheritance that you're going to enjoy there. So make death your friend, but only because you know that there's a river of living water flowing into you and into the world around you now. So, I am not much of a fisherman, but I do have friends and family who love it. Uh, I was not allowed to marry my wife until I had helped my brother-in-law push an ice house out in the middle of a lake in northern Minnesota for some spear fishing. Um, yeah, I saw a bumper sticker yesterday while I was driving around. It says, when hell freezes over, I'll fish there too. <laughs> I, I know people like that. I know people like that. Um, And I I mean, I'm not a big-time fisherman, but there have been those times when I've been out on a boat in the middle of a lake and you just can't bait the hook fast enough. 
because there's just so many fish biting and biting and biting, and you're, you know, you're reeling them in as fast as you can. You, you feel like you could probably fish with bare hands. You know what I'm talking about. That is the sort of experience that you should have in mind when you read about the impact that this river of life has on the Dead Sea in Ezekiel's vision. That suddenly a place where you would have never in a million years bothered dragging a net down a hill to go cast it into the lake is teeming with life. It's life like you'd find in the Mediterranean Sea, but now inland in this sea that once was completely barren. And fishing is one of the great symbols in the New Covenant for what it's like to proclaim the gospel of the good news of what Jesus has done. So put yourself back into Peter's shoes in John 21. Jesus is dead. Peter doesn't know what to do, so he hops back in his old fishing boat and goes out on the water. He's got to find a way to make a living again, right? He's just been wandering around on this pipe dream for the last couple years, but it didn't pan out. So what does he do? He goes back fishing again, and he's out, and he's fishing all night, and nothing is happening, and nothing is happening. He's just chucking the net, pulling it in, chucking the net, pulling it in, chucking it out, pulling it in. Nothing is happening. What is the point to all of this futility? There are no fish here for some reason. And suddenly you hear a voice from the shore. Hey, cast your net over there. You'll catch something. Okay, so one last time, maybe that guy on the beach just has a better vantage point than I do. Chuck the net out and bam! The net is so full, you're amazed it doesn't just capsize the boat from the sheer weight of the fish. And then you realize, oh, that voice I heard, I know that voice. That was Jesus. And then it occurs to him that what's standing there on the beach That's the walking, living, breathing temple of God with the spirit of living water flowing out into him. And now suddenly you are living, Ezekiel 47, where the waters that had no fish are suddenly so teeming with fish that the only explanation is that God is in this place. So what do they do? They grow back to shore as fast as they can, hauling the net behind him, and Peter falls down on his face and worships. That's the context you should have in mind when you hear Jesus say to Peter and Matthew, I will make you to fish for people. I'll make you to fish for human beings. And like Peter, we all fish with nets. This is a great uh, encouragement and help to me personally, so I just want to share it with you. Um, A lot of the times when churches talk about how we share the gospel, we can come away with the impression that it's like a technique for plucking fish from the water with our bare hands and that it depends on our skill and sharing the gospel exactly rightly. Now, learn how to do it, right? You do actually have to faithfully present the gospel. But this is the way a net works. You do not look and say, oh, they're like down in a deep water fishing, fishing, the way that Peter's doing it. You don't look down and say, oh, there's a gazillion fish. I'm going to position my net perfectly. You just know that there's fish in the lake. You can see the top of the lake, and you've got the net in your hand, so you chuck it out there, It drops, and you pull it back in, and fish come with it. The power for saving people is not with us and with our technique for sharing the gospel. The power for saving the lost is the net, is the gospel. This is why Paul can say in Romans that he's not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The power is not Paul. The power is the proclamation of the gospel. When the gospel is proclaimed, the net goes out, it drops in the water, And where there was death, suddenly you pull in life. Your job is just to throw the net. My job is just to throw the net. And so we've got to be fishers of people. Okay, moving on. But what happens once people are converted, once they're brought into the kingdom of God, once there is life where there once was death, Well, suddenly, we also turn our attention from the water and we see that alongside the banks of the Dead Sea that used to just be, you know, chunks of salt and sand, we've got trees bearing fruit. And I think this probably would have been clear to Ezekiel, though I I can't prove this, but this is one of the classic Old Testament symbols for human beings who live lives of righteousness. A tree that bears fruit in season. If you were going to look at a passage like Psalm chapter 1, how blessed is the man who does not stand in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree 
firmly planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither, and when it, whatever he does, he prospers. The language, even in Hebrew there, about the tree that bears fruit in season, its leaf does not wither, is pretty much identical with what you find in Ezekiel 47. And if that's what it takes, if this is what Ezekiel is teaching the church today, that this is what it takes to actually be that righteous person, is that you, actually, you do have to be planted by rivers of living water, and that the living water is the water of the Holy Spirit, that is tremendously encouraging because I think all of us can relate to the experience of trying to be good and failing miserably. <laughs> For those of you who've seen the show The Good Place, like, there's, a, there's a part in the show where one of the main characters has this realization that she's being really bad. She wants to try and turn her life around, so she goes and she starts trying to do the things that'll make her good. She starts volunteering with like uh, environmentalist organizations and picking up litter, and she's doing great for a little while. And then she's just like, what's the point to all this? My life's not getting any better because I'm trying to be good. And so she collapses back into apathy. That is the way it goes for every human being when we try to be good on our own power for any reason that we could give to motivate ourselves. So if you're a Christian, the first lesson is this. Rest in the fact that your roots are nourished by a stream of living water that flows from God himself, the river of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to provide your own water and sustenance. It's there. It's given for you. And so when you do work trying to live a life of righteousness, you can work in confidence and you can work in hope because God is already working in you and providing for you everything that you need for life and godliness. But it also means that you have to keep focused on your goal. I mean, We don't have time to do this right now, but if I could survey all of you in the audience, I would ask you for one sentence where you tried to sum up the the point of your Christian life. Because the goal of our Christian life is righteousness. It's completion in Christ. It's it's Christian perfection is the, the way that Paul says it in Colossians 1. And another way of expressing that same reality is to say with John 13 that we were created to bear much fruit. We were created to bear much fruit. So don't settle for anything less than bearing fruit. Investigate your life. Run through the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you see yourself actively living according to the reality of the fruit of the Spirit? Do you see when you look over the scope of your Christian history that you are growing in those fruits? that there's more now than there was then. And if you don't, recommit yourself. You were not saved by Jesus just to be plucked from the, the now living Dead Sea into a boat. You were saved by Jesus to become a tree who's planted by living water, nourished by the Holy Spirit, growing up into righteousness, and constantly bearing fruit and always having mature leaves on you. Settle for nothing less. And another way of talking about this is to put us back into context. Because one of the little details that I think is fascinating about this passage is that there's still salt. Like, God didn't take it all away. There's still salt. So the disciples are also called the salt of the earth. And what that means, what that would have meant to Ezekiel, is that salt is a preservative. The new covenant is still a time where the world is oriented towards death. The world around the church is oriented towards death. The world around the church is still, despite its best efforts, only ever producing systems that yield more and more and more and more and more death. But inside the church, every believer becomes a grain of salt. And every time you sprinkle a grain of salt onto something rotting, what happens? The process of decay and rot gets slowed, gets arrested. The very presence of the salt changes the reaction chemically. I mean, you know what it's like. You open your refrigerator, you pull out that pack of chicken that you thought you still had a week left on, but it turns out it went bad two weeks ago. You cut into it and, whoo, yeah, you get the stench of death. The world is like that. But in God's providence, while he's bringing life to the world, he's still making all of us to be people who are bearing fruit for righteousness and who are salt in the world that's arrested and is slowing the process of death and decay around us. So that takes us back through all of these major symbols in Ezekiel. 
where God is giving Ezekiel the picture of what it's going to be like to live in the new covenant that we all live in right now. We have Jesus, the walking temple of God, where creator and creation have collapsed into one. We have the spirit of Jesus flowing out from Jesus, giving life to the world. We have the new birth that comes from the proclamation of the gospel, fishing for people, pulling in the nets. And we have these pictures of what it means to live a life of righteousness in the midst of a world that still is oriented toward death. So these are my challenges for you today. First, for those of you who are believers in this room, don't settle for anything less than bearing fruit and for being salt. Remember that your dedicated commitment every day to righteousness matters. Do not grow weary in doing good. You were created in Jesus Christ to bear fruit because this is how God is glorified. Remember also the really terrifying picture of Isaiah's vineyard from Isaiah chapter 5, where God says that Israel before us was like a vineyard, and God did everything that that vineyard would need to flourish— And he kept coming back year after year after year after year, waiting to find fruit, and it wasn't there. So what does he do? He destroys the vineyard. You were called by grace, and now, after grace, it is our responsibility to make every effort to bear fruit that is pleasing to God. We have to cooperate with him. So ask yourself, am I bearing the fruit of the Spirit? Search your heart honestly. And if you're not, repent. And then, in hope and confidence in the God who provides you with the Holy Spirit, do better. And I can say do better confidently, not because I think I'm awesome or that any of us left to ourselves are awesome, but because I have confidence in the rivers of living water that are nourishing all of our root systems. And, but this is the second call today. There comes a point where Ezekiel has to be led into the river of life where the angel that's showing him around says, now get into the river. Some of you in this room have not gotten into the river that restores you. But this is why Jesus came. If you find yourself in despair when you look at the world around you, if you find yourself really depressed when you look at your own attempts to be good in your own power and you realize that you're just not making it, you see yourself hurting people around you, you see yourself hurting yourself, you see that your life isn't amounting to anything, this is the answer. It's that you live in a world that is a dead sea, that's oriented towards your death and the death of everybody else around you. And if you ask yourself why you and other folks around you can't just be good people, here is why. It's because you're in captivity to sin and death. You need Jesus' help. So if you ask Jesus to help you and to give you the Holy Spirit, if you confess that you are caught in this system of death, he will set you free. If we confess our sins, the Bible says, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And once you've been brought back to life, Once you find yourself plucked from death like a fish in a net, then you'll find that what you hope for, at least in yourself, the opportunity to be a good person who builds up the people around you, who is kind and truly loving, you'll find that that becomes possible for you in a way that it wasn't before. So I'm going to ask that every, uh, every person in the room, please bow your heads and close your eyes very briefly. If there are any of you in the room right now who feel like, man, that is me. For some reason, I just cannot be good, but I think that Jesus can give me a way to grow up. That will, he will save me. He will give me a new life in the Holy Spirit, and I want it. Go ahead and raise your hand. I see a hand. Sir, thank you for raising your hand. I see another hand. Two hands. Okay, go ahead and put them down. After this service, I'm going to be standing down here at the far right in, uh, in front of these sort of green fold-out chairs. If you raised your hand, please come to talk to me personally. We're going to sing a couple more songs, but don't leave without speaking with me. Friends, that's how the net gets cast. All it takes is we open our mouth and God goes to work. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came in the flesh, that you lived a sinless life, that you atoned us, 
and that, Lord, you are coming again to judge the living and the dead, but that we don't have to fear it because we know that you're with us and that you're for us, that you're making us alive, and that we can bear fruit for you that's pleasing to you. And so we praise you for every good thing you've done today. Let your word go deep into our hearts. And Lord, encourage us as we go forward to celebrate you and your resurrection life. In Jesus' name. Hey, everyone. Right now is when we are entering into our Ask Me Anything portion of the service. And so throughout the service, um, there have been people who have an, um, sent in questions that have to do with the sermon or something else that maybe someone wants to ask um, whoever preached today. And so we have a few of those in. You can still text 608-836-3236 to send in questions if any come up as you're listening here. All right, so the first question is for somebody, is from someone who um, is wanting to know about how to make connections for themselves in the way that you did in the sermon. So how do I make connections like the ones you made in the sermon when I read the Old Testament by myself? I feel like I get very little out of it, even though um, there's, it's um, a full of relevance and meaning. That's a fantastic question. Um, I think if more Christians were honest, they'd admit that that is kind of our default setting as readers of the Bible. I would say that for me personally, uh, w what that question just described is not just my experience of reading the Old Testament. It's my experience of reading the Bible, period. When I start to read the Bible, especially if it's something that I haven't really studied through before, I read it and I go, huh, I have no idea what that's about. That, that's just normal for me. And I think probably for, for most mature Christians that I know. But... Uh, I also feel like my experience of normal Bible reading for the Old Testament and the New is a lot like uh, the experience that Daniel has when there's a revelation and he's pondering what it can mean and then suddenly an angel shows up and tells him, well, this is what's going to happen. Or, or, I mean, just to keep with the life of Daniel, when like the hand appears and writes a message on the wall for the Babylonians and then Daniel comes and interprets what it means, I usually have to wait and I can wait confidently knowing that if I read something and I stare at it and I wait and I pray about it, that God starts to point to different connections um, and helps me see meaning that otherwise I just could never see with my natural mind, and that that is the normal Christian Bible reading experience, that you are not left to your human capacity to try and figure out the depth of divine meaning, but the Holy Spirit's job as the Spirit of Jesus is to lead the church into all truth and part of that means giving us insight into what the Bible means. Um, I, I'm just, I'm being all kinds of nerdy this morning, so I'm going to lean into it. But there's a story about Thomas Aquinas, great Bible scholar and theologian from the Middle Ages, uh, who whenever he would run up against a text of Scripture that he couldn't figure out, he would literally just lie down, prostrate on the floor of his cell, and weep until God showed him what it meant. And that was his normal practice. I doubt that there have been many created beings in the scope of human history that have brains as gigantic as Thomas Aquinas's. And I take great comfort in that. Some practical application for your quiet times there. <laughs> 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 Um, all right, so the next question. What is the purpose of Jesus' post-mortem appearances to his disciples being somewhat ambiguous in terms of his physical nature? Or put differently, why didn't the disciples recognize him more immediately during his post-mortem appearances? Gosh, I love both the reality behind that question and the question. Um, man, I think that's one of the coolest things about the stories of Jesus' resurrection is like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's got to be one of the stories that this questioner had in mind, where there's two people walking with Jesus for miles and miles and miles who have been his disciples on earth. They've been spending more time with him than with any other human being for years, and they don't realize that it's him until he breaks the bread and vanishes, and then they're like, oh. Um, like literally ghosts them. Um, I think that, what, that what's going on here is because is that Jesus is the firstborn of the new creation. That when you encounter Jesus in his physical human body, in the, its resurrection form and power, you are literally encountering the first fruits of what it's going to be like for all of us to have resurrected bodies. And so there is some continuity between who we are now 
and who we will be then in the way that there is some continuity between who Jesus was when he was just with his disciples and who he was after his resurrection. But there's also something new and strange and powerful. Jesus is just like walking through walls and disappearing. And I mean, like it's even strange when you compare it to the standards of Jesus's life narrated in the gospel all the way through there. So I think what you should take from that is there's reason to hope because there is a new and greater world and country coming for us. And we get like these really, really cool little glimpses of it in the resurrection stories about Jesus. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's supposed to be a tantalizing mystery. You're supposed to want more of that without really feeling like you totally grasp it here and now, I think. All right, this person says, I'm confused about the meaning of salt in the Bible. In this sermon, the salt in the Dead Sea is deadly, but also there are parts of the Bible where salt seems to mean something good. Um, how can we, like how we as believers are the salt of the earth? So what does salt mean? How, what do we make of that? Yeah, I think that the first thing I would say to this person is just caution them against looking for too much harmony and unity across the whole of the Bible. I mean, another symbol we could talk about is fire, Right? Like, sometimes fire is a bad thing, and sometimes fire is a good thing. You've got, like, the tongues of fire descending on the believers at Pentecost. Good thing. But you've also got, like, passages in Isaiah where uh, Isaiah talks about how when people try to figure out their own ways morally and they light fires and fire brands for themselves to light their ways, their fire gets out of control and it ends up burning them. Bad thing. So salt doesn't necessarily have to be one thing all the time, always across the whole of Scripture, that it's going to be context-dependent. But um, in this case, how you should understand the salt of the earth and the salt that I think is intentionally left behind by God in Ezekiel, even though there's fresh water flowing, is, I, as I think, the way that I preached it. The point is that there is still the power of death that is not yet overcome, but that salt slows and opposes and is the opposite of the decaying force of death in the world and that our very presence makes it harder for death to be death until the time when God does ultimately swallow up death forever. All right, this person is wondering about application. So they say, I struggle with, to apply metaphors practically to my own life. When I go back into the real world, how do I turn, get into the river, into something real and intentional? Yep. Great question. Um, I would encourage you to think about the list of, quote, practices or disciplines that Christians have dedicated their lives to for thousands of years. It is. Read the Bible and wait on God to show you its meaning. It is pray to God, not just in your power, but pray expecting that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you to pray as you ought, even though you don't necessarily know how now. It is. Continue to fellowship with other believers because you know that when two or more are gathered together in your name, Jesus himself is going to be there in the midst of you. You're getting in the river. Um, it, it's, those, it's majoring in the majors of the Christian life. When you do those things, when you, like Jesus says, pray and ask for the Spirit, when you're doing those things, you are so far as it depends on you getting in the river and the one who asks you to do those things is faithful. He'll meet you there. All right. If Christ is the living water that provides sustenance we don't have to, we, that we don't have to work to secure, oh, um, then how do you reconcile that metaphor with the reality that we need spiritual disciplines to keep us close to God's word and grow in his spirit? Yes. Um, you have to be actively passive in the Christian life. <laughs> that the grace of, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer kind of famously took down the, the cheap grace of his day, like the view that God's saving grace is so great that at that point, you know, who cares what you do? That there is such a thing as a costly grace. That God gives you his grace, but that grace means giving you the capacity to do the things that you once couldn't do. So then you actually have to do the things. When, like, resurrected bodies aren't just resurrected to stand there in suspended animation. They are resurrected and given life so that they can act by the power of that life. And the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, is the, resurrected, is the resurrecting spirit of Jesus in you, giving life to your mortal body so that you can do the things that you couldn't do before. So, um, I like to think of this dynamic as physical therapy, but for the whole person. 
It's physical therapy in the sense that a surgeon actually needs to correct something that's out of alignment in me that I couldn't fix on my own. But once it's fixed, I actually have to go through the work of doing the exercises to strengthen that body part, whatever it is. Like for me, in, my, in the course of my history, it's mostly been my shoulders and my knees. For my wife right now, it's her foot. Or, but that, that same principle applies to the Christian life. God has given life and healed a part of you that you could never heal on your own, and now it's your responsibility to do the exercises to strengthen that part. That's good. Thanks, Devin. Uh, we're going to conclude here from our AMA portion of the time. Um, if you are with us here in person or if you are watching with us online, we have people who would love to pray with you. And so if you're here in the service um, over to your left, we've got people um, who would love to pray with you. Um, Devin is also here and he'd be happy to pray with you. And then um, online, um, we've got um, prayer hosts there as well. Uh, will you close us out? I will. Yeah, and also I'll say that for those of you who put your hands up to say that you felt like God was talking to you and that you wanted to... Re- you wanted to know who Jesus was and wanted to find this river of living water, please come and talk to me first. I saw two hands. There may have been more. There were lights shining in my faces. If I didn't look at you, that doesn't mean that God didn't see your hand. So please do come and speak with me right down there. Uh, Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you uh, for every good thing that you have done. Thank you that we can come to you and find help in our time of need. Thank you that we can ask for the Holy Spirit, confident that you're a good father who wants to give gifts to his children. So we ask for the Holy Spirit, for all of us individually and collectively. Raise us up to newness of life like the life of your Son and help us to anticipate the day when what's great and awesome and mysterious about him will be our normal experience. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.